This week on Quadriga, Nobel Peace Prize, a boost for the European idea? The EU is still mired in the deepest economic crisis in its history. Even though the Nobel Committee has praised the Union's contributions to reconciliation and democratic processes on the continent. The stabilizing part played by the European Union has helped to transform most of Europe from a continent of war to a continent of peace. Will this prize help restore faith in Europe? Your host on Quadriga, Melinda Crane. Can the EU live up to its Nobel Peace Prize? That's what we want to talk about today on Quadriga. Hello and welcome. I'm Melinda Crane. And we want to talk about that subject with a great round of international authors who have been following events in Europe for quite a time. Pascal Hugues is a French author based here in Berlin. She writes for Le Point magazine and she is also a freelance author of such works as Matt and Mathilde, a portrait of her French and German grandmothers. Ursula Weidenfeld is an award-winning business and economic journalist who has written for the Financial Times Deutschland and the Handelsblatt. And Ewald König covered Germany for many years for the Austrian newspaper Die Presse. He's now editor-in-chief of the portal youraktiv.de, which is a pan-European website reporting in 15 different languages. I'd like to start out by asking all three of you what you think was the prize deserved. Pascal Hugues. Absolutely. Um, it was funny when I, I heard it on the radio and I thought, oh, what a strange idea. You know, they haven't done anything. For, and I, th I suppose a lot of people in Europe have reacted like me. Uh, what have they done? Because you have at the moment, you have when you, when you say Europe, you have these images of people quarreling, of a financial crisis, everything negative and very complicated and very grey. And then in the evening, I saw on television the pictures of the war and the picture of the reconciliation after the war, especially between de Gaulle and Adenauer, and then I thought, great. And uh, I think it's a great idea, it's a wonderful prize, and it's exactly the right time to give it. Eval König, EU, a worthy uh, Nobel Peace Laureate? Well, let me give you my answer in, th in three levels. The first level is my professional um, job as a journalist covering EU affairs. Um, I think, um, and, and having been a correspondent and uh, written a lot of um, eyewitness reports on the fall of the Iron Curtain, um, I think it's a very good idea, but it must not be overestimated. Yeah? Maybe we have a pause for a moment and um, have a good idea about the advantage of Europe uh, in the the crisis. The second level is um, as an individual, citizen of the European Union, one of 500 million people. Um, so I myself have won the uh, Nobel Peace uh, Prize too. Maybe I can write it in the next uh, CV that <laughs> I received this prize uh, for um, one uh, 500 uh, millions. And, uh, but I also have to think on this uh, huge number of young people in Greece and Spain and other countries uh, might be uh, that they um, see it uh, with a cynicism yeah, and they laugh at it and they are not content with this uh, decision. And uh, the third level I mentioned is a very, very personal one. I have three sons, 30, 28 and 25. And when they have been 16, I had to think on my father when he was 16, he had to go to war to the Normandy. And um, he's, uh, he's, one, he's the oldest uh, marathon runner in, in Austria. He's 86, still running, not the whole marathon, but half marathon. And he was so happy to have a neighbor in the marathon coming from France, from Normandy. So he was so happy about this uh, development. And uh, I'm quite confident that my sons and even their sons will never have to go to war somewhere. So it's worth to consider this. Eva Kuning, thank you very much. And glad you mentioned those young voices from Spain and elsewhere, because we're going to hear some of them later on okay. in the show. Ursula Weidenfeld, what do you think? Was this Nobel Peace Prize deserved? Well, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think that the Euro European idea was um, 
awarded. So that is okay, and it is okay to um, to, to to give the Nobel Peace Prize to Europe in in in, in the sense of um, just honor, honoring uh, politicians and and an idea which was uh, quite quite great in, in the 70s, 80s, and especially in the in the 50s. What I'm not sure about is whether it is deserved by our today politicians. And um, how, if, if you look how we are, we are trying to cope with the crisis and, and, and how we do on a day-to-day -day basis and how we try to just struggle on and, and just mingling through all that steps to rescue the euro, to come to, come, come to, to terms with Greece and, and doing things like this. I think there's um, not much space for the European idea today. So I, I think it is uh, okay to award but but I, I I thought well it would would have been right to, to give it to Helmut Kohl or to um, the great Europeans we have in Europe, but um, to do it to, to give it to to Europe, I, I thought that is um, might be a little bit um, uh, yeah it, it is just um, I, I I don't know I I, I thought it is um, not 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 the right the right. Europe is no, not not a person, and the, the the persons who will just take the prize in in in, December, in November they they are uh, Martin Schulz, um, Hermann von Rompuy, and um, uh, Manuel Barroso, and three EU leaders, of course, yes. uh, leader of the com head of the Commission, uh, President, and uh, the head of the Parliament. Yes, and I, I'm I'm not sure whether these are, these are the right persons to just represent Europe today. May I no, add some remark? Uh, sure. Yeah, because yes. exactly this one is the question: uh, who is entitled to receive the prize? We have the same Europe question. Has no telephone number, but yes. it has it, yes. it, it, it's, an address now. Yes. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. So we didn't make over much uh, progress yeah. in the meantime. As an American, I must say, of course, I was reminded of the Nobel Peace Prize going to Barack Obama. And at that time, there was a lot of discussion about whether the committee doesn't sort of get out in front of itself in a slightly moralistic way by thinking it can shape world events by bestowing the prize. Do you have any sense of that kind of a feeling, Pascal, is, or is that sort of a mean way of looking at it? I think it's a mean way. I think it's a, <laughs> it's a you know, you always have people who spoil the the joy and who are sort of pessimistic about everything. Uh, you know, a prize is a prize. He said it has, um, it's, it's a big prize, and uh, but it's not, you, you mustn't overrate it. It's a little boost, it's a little tap on the shoulder. Uh, I find as well it but, would but, have but been. But for whom? For well, whom? that's, the, that's the, the people who are going to receive the prize. I think it would have been good to ask your son, my son, your daughter. 27 children of Europe that was, receiving. Yeah, that yeah. was the proposal, <laughs> yeah. wasn't it, by the European but Interior that's, that's Minister ridiculous, or Interior it? Commissioner? Is it? Yeah, is it? I, I think it would have been better to ask them or to ask um, people who fought in the war and uh, your father and his marathon co who came from the Normandy. I mean, people who've, because that's the problem with Europe. I mean, when you look at it from a distance, not as a professional journalist, or it's a lot of very grave, very boring men who very idle, very, very self-confident, sure of themselves. And uh, I mean, there are not a lot of personalities in Europe who, who you really think, well, great, that's somebody very strong, uh, with a lot of experience, uh, very clever, who doesn't sort of put himself in the, in the, you know, who speaks, who doesn't speak technically, but who speaks emotionally. I don't know. I, I mean, they're very, on the, uh, you know, in the first uh, rang, they are very few of these people. I wouldn't, but, you know. The, the interesting thing that we can see from our discussion is that, in fact, how you think about the awarding of this prize very much depends whether you think they've awarded it for past achievements yeah. or, in a way, as an appeal to future ones. So let's take a brief look at what the EU did accomplish in the past at the origins of the European Union. Amid the devastation left by the Second World War, the dream of a united Europe to turn enemies and rivals into friends and even partners seemed impossible. In the beginning, six countries set up a common market for the coal and steel trades. They included historic arch rivals France and Germany. The founders' hope was that an economic union would also promote peace. The next achievement was the European Economic Community, which saw the development of shared political and social values. 
By 1989, the European community counted 12 members. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, 10 former East Bloc countries joined, looking not just for economic gain, but also democracy, human rights and the rule of law. Then the common currency, the euro, was introduced. Today it's used by 17 countries. The bloc received the prize for promoting peace and reconciliation on the continent, an achievement that is now at risk. So I'd like to ask the three of you what you think. To what degree was that post-war peace an EU achievement, an achievement of the a time, that time, of course, European economic community? Eva Koenig? Well, partly it was a special EU achievement. Um, I think on, on the young people, um, they take it granted that they are Erasmus students everywhere. That they Erasmus, can, of course, uh, is the program of uh, academic exchange between yes, all of the European universities, in, in, in for abroad, those who don't yes. know it. And um, to, to travel without border controls or duty problems or uh, changing money and so on. They take it for granted, it is normal. Yeah, but uh, young people have the experience for I think uh, four or five years now. Crisis, crisis, crisis. Yeah, currency crisis, euro crisis, and, and debt crisis, and so on. Uh, compared with relatively weak uh, persons on the top of the EU institutions, and um, so might be the, the the Nobel Prize was. Um, quite important to, to show them that there are okay, but, some but achievements. Looking at the post-war period, first of yes. all, let's come back to that in, yeah. a bit, in just a bit, but looking at the post-war period, mm. who is really uh, to get the credit for having achieved peace after that bitter, bitter war, and in fact two yeah. very bitter wars? I think the more, most important actors were uh, France and Germany for the reconciliation and all the other progress uh, that came, okay, but the most important ones were Germany and France. Ursula Weidenfeld, what about the US, the Allies, NATO? There are a number of other candidates we could be mentioning here too, aren't there? Yes, I think that um, the US, um, the NATO, the, uh, the, the international community comes um, has a very strong role in, in the European process, uh, especially since, since the 90s. So if you... Again, I'm trying to... I, I'd like to start out with this immediate post-war mm. period, because if we say, what is the historical achievement that brought peace to the European continent? That, that's, in a way, what I'd like to get at, first of all. Who was responsible in that first immediate post-war period that yes, we saw I, there I, I think that, that, that the U.S. have, have, uh, have, have a very, very uh, important role with the not only with the Marshall Plan, but be, with be, being the uh, protector of the f of free Europe and and being the um, uh, uh, with, with their with with the uh, with their army, but um, uh, especially with their politicians who just granted, for example, for Berlin for years and years. That was very important for for Europe. That was really really important for Germany. So I think it is not only. France and Germany, but it is um, yeah, it is England, it is the U.S., it is the um, uh, integration in the in the in the in the in the, in the military community of the West in, in the 50s. It has been um, the the uh, integration in the world market again. That was very very important, f especially for Germany in the 50s. So I think there is a uh, there are lots of um, points you have to make if you just ask who is who is who has won the, the Peace Nobel Prize in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the early years of, of Europe uh, after the, the Second World War. We've mentioned leaders several times. Pascal Hugues, the leaders of post-war Europe, the French, the Germans, those leaders truly had a vision, didn't they? If we look at Adenauer, uh, de Gaulle, have we not got that kind of leaders anymore, would you say? What was it that they had that we don't mm -hmm. seem to be able to do anymore? Well, you have to, you have to see where they came from. I mean, uh, uh, and, and how, especially between France and Germany, because these are the countries I, I, I know uh, the best. And, of course, the how, famous motor, the tandem, as we, as and we said, that got yeah. that steel and coal. But you can't the imagine. I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting when you look at the little history, the daily history, how, and, and when you remember how much hated and incredible nationalism there was after the First World War, after the Second World War. And we come, we've come from very, very far. And we've achieved something extraordinary. It's about 60, 70 years ago. That's not very long. 
uh, well, the first and then the Second World War, and that are both countries, I mean, France and Germany, it's quite boring now because we know each other so well and you know there's no and that's the price of normality is that I don't know any young people who want to go and do an exchange and when they're 16 in Germany they go <laughs> and do an exchange to France they go far away they want to go to America they want to go to Canada but they don't want to go to France because it's too it's too yeah it's a neighbor it's almost like Germany and that's a great achievement uh, now you had these this context which which also and then you had the leaders who came from these I mean when you Adenauer, the goal, they'd lift something. When you look at politicians today, I mean, it's good that it's so, but they, you know, they haven't had any, most of them are apparatchik. Uh, they, they start in the fun functionaries, uh, they start in the, in the party when they are 16, 17, as teenager, and they climb themselves and push. And, but most of them haven't lived very much. And that's a problem. And de Gaulle had, 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 uh, had done the First World War. He'd been in exile in London. Um, uh, Adenauer had, been, had had a very tormented, very difficult time in the Nazi time. They'd, they'd seen their, uh, uh, I don't know, had seen uh, Cologne uh, uh, in absolute ruins. Uh, you know, they had, uh, they, they, there was, uh, the, the new politicians have, were now they've all, almost, all of them have been born after the war. You can't but blame but them I, for that. But, 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 but I think what, what you have always take into account, they had the uh, economic development on, on their yeah. side. Yeah. But it, it was not, it was... They were starting from nothing. They were they? starting from nothing yeah. and then they yeah. had 30 years of just growth of um, m pe making people uh, wealthy again. So they had the economic development and they always made Europe the, the, the vision of, of Europe and, and peace in Europe together with look at our economic yeah. success, yeah. look at it, it, it pays, they, they, are, they are just profits from Europe. And I think this is one of the big problems we have today. We always had Europe not only as, um, as a political vision which brings peace and reconciliation and things like that, but we always said, look, look at Europe, that is very, very important for our for, for, for our economy. It is uh, important for, for our wealth and, and for our just trying to become rich again. The and original in, in, idea. And, 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 and the, just, just this moment, in, in the moment in, 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 which breaks this vision of just <laughs> making peace and bringing money into into the countries now nowadays we have, we only have the, the vision but the economic pro, uh, promise behind that this is just destroyed and i think this is one of the big problems for what which makes our politicians now so gray and boring and just being desperate seeking for something like a european vision so mm -hmm. one issue here being raised is whether it's perhaps less about the particular leaders and the vision than the economic circumstances. At the time, we had the idea of economic interdependence. That, of course, is still an underpinning of the EU. But we also, as Ursula Weinfeld said, had a, a, a pie that was growing. Now we have a pie that appears to be, if not shrinking, at least stagnating, so to speak. Ewald König, is that the big distinction between then and now? Well, um, in the post-war period, uh, they had uh, these strong visions, and I think uh, in the moment uh, we are not satisfied with the performance of the uh, leading uh, persons, but may, might be that in the future we recognize what happened uh, behind the stage today, what is developing. Maybe in the future we can realize it, what happened today. Today we do not realize it. And? What's your what's your uh, preliminary analysis of what's happening today? Well, that makes it different? I'm not a prophet. I'm wondering, namely, about yeah. another structural factor, namely the primacy of the markets. Yeah. One of the things that was said by the German finance minister when the prize was awarded is that this is a recognition that the EU is about so much more than spreads mm -hmm. and rescue packages. Mm -hmm. Is there, in some way, now a primacy of automatic? market mechanisms that makes it that, that greatly decreases the room for maneuver in which political leaders can act I don't know it <laughs> uh, they try to but uh, I'm not convinced that it will really help in a very short time I don't know it 
I, I think that um, Wolfgang Schäuble said some, 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 some time ago that it has always been crisis which gave Europe a push to mm -hmm. just become more integrated, to, to come to terms with, with their own problems and, and their identity. And probably we are in a situation like that which yeah. um, just leads us to more Europe, to, probably to, to something like a better Europe. It has always been crisis, uh, which were the, um, which brought the energy to to uh, to Europe That's in the right. 50s, in the 70s, yes. and in the 90s. So it's probably not 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 the the the, the, the it's probably not not bad times for Europe now. A brief look, perhaps, at the 90s, because of course that was the time after the wall fell, when the EU, for much of Eastern Europe, represented democratization and the promise of belonging to that prosperous Western community. Pascal Uc, do you think that the EU still serves as an impetus in that kind of a way for reform, for creating rule of law and human rights? Yes, I think so. Yes, I think so. Uh, it's very interesting as well as you, when you go outside the EU. I mean, when you go to your country, to America, I, I was in New York in the, in the spring and I came back and I was so happy to, I mean, I love New York, <laughs> but I was so happy to be here in a country which is very democratic, in a country where you can, when you're ill, you can go to hospital, you don't have to pay anything. I mean, you're insured uh, in a country when you have, uh, I mean, I think if you, if you look at, at, at a lot of countries in the, in the world and they, they can be very envious of Europe, I think we still, yes, it is still, I mean, all our countries are are uh, functioning democracies, are places where there is, uh, you know, nobody is really, really poor that they have to, I mean, you do, but I mean, you, you, most people are insured and get some kind of money. Uh, I mean, it's not the Wild West and, and, and it's not a banana republic. And, uh, and I think that a lot of people envy Europe. And we have to, remind, to remember that, and especially in a time of economic <coughs> turbulences that we have now, I think it has to, you have to have the economic strength, as you said, which is very important. On the other hand, you have to have this idea uh, to make it a, a little bubbly and, 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 and to, 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 to carry the, uh, the economic reforms. I mean, both go hand in hand. But I think it would be very unfair to say that, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous to say that Europe is a failure and that it has no use now. Um, Eva Kuni, would you say that we have a European sense of citizenship? The idea, of course, of the EU symbolizing uh, democracy, human rights, rule of law is something that you addressed in the series of articles when you traveled around uh, Eastern Europe after the fall of the wall. What would you say today? Do we have a sense of being European citizens? Not yet. It is developing. I think uh, uh, as attractive uh, the EU is for the candidate countries or for uh, future uh, EU members, um, there is, uh, till now, we don't have the sense of European citizenship as well as we don't have, up to my opinion, a European public. We don't have European media, we don't have a European public, and um, but I think the European, the feeling for the European citizenship is developing. Well, I think yeah. I think that um, the academic use, for example, mm. is some. Um, they are European citizens. Mm. So if you look at them, they are just are going to Paris, to London, yes, yes, uh, sure. studying yeah. in, 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 in in Munich or in in, in in Rome. So I think they have something of a sense of you being European citizens, without knowing that, with, but, without having yeah. the impetus to say, well, we are the Europeans. But if they you just to, live Europe. Yeah. And if the you young go to, to the US well. or to Asia, do you say I'm European? Yes. Yes, of course. You do? That's exactly yeah. where you say that. Maybe well, because they, they don't, they don't say know where I, your I don't say. But but I think the the, um, the the young academic uh, the, the young academics they do. But they that's just... where you that's where you feel European when you go far away. My son is in Quebec at the moment, and he said, uh, "Oh, mommy, at the at the school they said to me you're German, and they know about Germany, they know Hitler, <laughs> they know beer, and they know Mercedes." I think it's a bit. <laughs> and he got a very good mark because he had to 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 sketch the map of Europe, mm -hmm. and he did it like that, and they didn't know, and there he felt. I, he said to me, you know, I feel really European. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so maybe different. they are part of an elite. Probably. And not well, yeah, but I mean, you know, every, every... But Europe, I think Europe always was uh, something like an elite yeah. project. And mm -hmm. that is one of, yeah. one of uh, that that's probably is, is a problem that yeah. we have now. Yeah. It, it was <laughs> always the and same. And you have a, a lot of a very good schooling system in all the European <coughs> countries. And I think everybody, should, every young European, French or German who goes 
one in his life uh, to to America or to uh, or to Canada will will have the same feeling that they are that they're very far away and that they belong they're closer to the Spains Spanish people or to the Brits than mm. to the Americans we spoke at the outset about uh, whether the EU can, whether the Nobel committee uh, perhaps had the intention of trying to change consciousness about the EU and perhaps even restore this sense of the EU being a beacon um, whether in fact it was looking to the future as opposed to the past when it awarded the prize let's see how Europeans today did react to that prize in countries like Spain, where protests have become commonplace, the announcement of the award has received a mixed reception. That won't put food on the table. I think it's great because we Europeans are great people. We're very proud. There are certain interests behind awarding the EU a prize like that. I don't think it's justified. That's a sentiment echoed in another crisis country, Greece. I don't believe it has been uh, helping the stability at all, because if it had been, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. The Nobel Prize, despite the inequality in the EU and the North hating the South? But many Germans were generally more positive about the prize. The European Union is committed to peace. It helps out other countries and it helps to promote globalization. It might help those countries being affected by the financial crisis here in Europe by giving them the feeling we're all in this together. So, as I mentioned earlier, some voices there from different countries, two of them crisis affected, and of course, some of them, in fact, quite cynical. Ewald König, if the prize was intended as a message, do you think it can change minds? Hmm. I hope so, that some people change their minds and uh, they see that it is in a mandate uh, for the, for the uh, future and not only an achievement uh, for the achievements in the past. Um, maybe some people change their minds, but I'm not too optimistic that it will change. As I said in the beginning, uh, we can uh, pause for a moment, um, but uh, you remember what happened when uh, Barack Obama uh, received the prize, nothing. <laughs> Pascal, what would it take, do you think, to restore the idea of the EU as an inspiring project? It almost seems, it's, it, it, it almost sounds pathetic now mm, to speak mm, of mm. the EU in those terms. But of course, that's what the Nobel Prize Committee was, was meaning, wasn't it? Well, first of all, what the Nobel Prize Committee did is that we all stop a minute and look back and think, well, it's not as bad what we've achieved. I mean, mm -hmm. we do it there, here extensively, uh, but maybe uh, these young people we saw on the films, uh, you know, you talk at it in the evening, you have one, it probably has no use, but you have one minute when you think, well, actually, it's quite a great idea. That would be something. Then you would have to have maybe leaders who are a bit more, I think, uh, in, live in reality and who, who make it a concrete idea, not only, you know, I mean, uh, Europe, when you read the paper, it's awful. I mean, the last post I would like to be sent to is Brussels. I find it, I, I shouldn't <laughs> say that as a journalist, but I found it terrible. It's only about resolutions. It's very technocratic. It's, it's very, um, yeah, it's very dry. It's very gray. And uh, you have to make it live, alive. You have to make it lively. And you have to say, yes, we have a very difficult crisis. Um, uh, we hope that we're going to go through. We don't have miracle recipes for it, uh, but there's no other way. That's the other thing you have to, you have to say. There is no other way of staying together. I've, I've actually just been in Brussels, and I must say I have a slightly different opinion. I'm always astonished that they achieve anything at all. <laughs> if I look at my own country, the U.S., which is facing a somewhat similar constellation, a stagnant economy fears that the pie is shrinking, Two parties from the same culture, speaking the same language with 200 years of common history, can't agree 
on measures mm -hmm. for how to get out of the crisis. Is it surprising that 27 countries move rather slowly? <clears throat> no, I think um, what, what we had to learn in the, in the past years is that po politics always is too slow to cope with the problems which appear on a day-to-day -day basis. Particularly but too slow when the markets move at, in, in, a, in a speed of milliseconds. Yes, but I, but I think that uh, um, the, 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 probably the, the thing we have to remember is that um, self-consciousness of pol politicians is needed to just say, well, we, we won't be fast enough in any time, whether with the cope with the markets, whether to um, just give an answer to China or to, to, to other countries in time. So if, if we can't do that, and Europe never will be able to do it, not only because we are 27, but also because democratic systems tend to be slow. They tend to be, um, to, to have to find compromises which um, are not shiny and, and not glorious. They are always boring and gray and something like, um, you say, well, and th th all that stuff needs to, to be um, negotiated in months and years. That, that is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. But I think if you just be sure that democracy is the right thing to do, that Europe is the right thing to live in and to to fill up with life, then it is no, no there is no alternative to, to, to just have this way, to try this way, to come to, to terms with 27 um, nations. And I think in, in this respect, it just, it's not too bad what we achieve and, and not too slow what is, um, what is to be negotiated. But um, I think that what we have to do is to just remember that Europe is a lot more than economy. Mm. And, um, and and this is the, the, I, I think this is one 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 thing which, which strikes me as an economic journalist most that everybody is just only looking at the economy but not at the peace you brought us at the um, just a common vision we have the thing that we all live in democracies that we all have um, states and bureaucracies we can in a way rely on and, and being treated as citizens and not as uh, just some, 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 something else. So I think this is probably the thing we have to remember in receiving the Nobel Prize, that mm. Europe is a lot more and than economy. I would like to, to compare it with the German situation, with the same language and the same mentality and how difficult is the decision making uh, in the federalistic system of Germany. But, but and that, now works, in, in, that works well. In Just, this, it is it works, slow, but, but, but look slow, at, the, yeah? at, 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 at the results and you, will, and you won't say that. The more complicated is in the EU with uh, so many languages and so many different mentalities. It works, it is slow, but you must consider the situation in Germany too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and also, uh, <coughs> coming back to the economics, I, I get asked from my French uh, newspapers every three weeks, well, do the Germans want to get out of the euro? And it's very difficult to explain they don't want to and they can't. I mean, maybe it would be important to remind as well how much, I mean, a rich country like Germany has profit. I mean, it's really profit from the, from the euro. And that it is impossible. We, have a, we, are, we are so <coughs> intricate. We are, so, uh, we are such a, a, a very tight community that nobody can step out and say, well, I'm just going my own way now, and certainly not Germany. Well, I, I so think, I, I think the, the euro was the price Germany had to pay for <coughs> the reunification, for just mm. enlarging Europe. So that was something Germany had to pay, and the bill is just served now. So it might be the right time to discuss uh, something which we call um, progress in, in a, in a, in a political sense, but not in an economic sense, because the German uh, employees, they didn't, they, they didn't had a profit from the Europe in the past 15 years, uh, in the well, past 10 years. Now, one of the ironies of the current situation is that, in fact, Germany long saw the European Union as a way to get out of some of the very difficult sovereignty issues that it faced after the war. It was eager not to have to participate militarily in, for instance, uh, <clears throat> missions overseas. It was eager basically to melt into a larger framework. And now what we have today is, in fact, Germany as the absolute primus inter pares in Europe, the leading power, and in facing a great deal of resentment on all sides. Ewald König. Um, 
What do you think? We have two visions of Germany, basically, at the moment. Many countries saying the Germans throw their weight around too much, the Germans really don't care about the rest of Europe. And then the other side, the German perception itself, we need to move ahead in a serious way to get real union, because otherwise the Eurozone is going to fail. Mm. What do you think? Which is the vision of, of Germany that you as an Austrian would have? Many countries, um, many governments um, see Germany as uh, primus inter Paris and ask them and request uh, this leadership in Europe. But on the other hand, uh, they blame Germany if something goes wrong. Yeah. So. Um, Kind of a double bind, isn't it? Yes, I think definitely. If it was not and Germany's especially choice, for, uh, yeah. if it was was not Germany's choice to to mm. become primus inter pares, mm. Germany just always tended the past sixty years to uh, shrink itself to something which just could and would melt in in, mm. in something bigger in Europe or whatever. And I think it's uh, this is a development of the past ten years that you uh, that may brought about by European unification uh, by German unification. I, no, no. Things. I think the, the, the first ten years after the reunification, Germany had a lot of problems. <laughs> it was the thick man of Europe. It was um, some uh, it, Germany wasn't um, as important and uh, whether for for itself, but. Uh, but and 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 nor for for the European countries like it is today, and I think this is this um, to to just accept the role, to take it, and to try to make Europe probably a little bit more German than um, Southern European style. Um, that is a, a, a development we had in the past ten and years. It's also depending on the uh, persons acting. When Helmut Kohl was. Uh, um, ruling, uh, then he had uh, good consultations with small countries. He always, uh, behind the stage, uh, asked uh, the smaller countries and um, his colleagues. Don't uh, you think that, that Angela but, uh, Merkel does it? Angela Merkel does it, but not in the same extent. Maybe there is no time. We are 27 enough enough. now. Yes. Pascal, do you see the current German leaders? And not only the ones in power, but perhaps also the SPD chancellor candidate for elections next year, Per Steinbuch, as committed Europeans? <coughs> or do you have a sense that many people in Germany think, OK, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll just go our own way? No, I think they are committed. It's interesting because uh, when I arrived in Germany about 20 years ago, it was a, what uh, somebody called it the, the Euro jubilation. Everybody was European and they, you know, they didn't want to be German. True. They were from Bavaria, they were from Berlin, but they were not German. And then this, it was a kind of ersatz identity. You know, you were European, so you could escape being in German. German, which was, which is a difficult, or was a very difficult nationality. So it's changed completely what you were saying about uh, Angela Merkel. Uh, well, she's not very much, she doesn't frighten anybody anymore. Remember after unification, how uh, France and Britain were terrified of this big Germany in the middle of Europe. Well, nobody's terrified anymore. And uh, She seems to frighten the Greeks uh, considerably. They were out with Nazi symbols yes, when she but, was I visiting. Mean, and excuse me, that's the the, the own stupidness of, uh, of of other countries, and it's always easy. You know, when there is a problem with Germany, you come up with the and that's but I it find was it not but, uh, a it, common it, sense. It, it's, it's not, it it's not, not a Greek sense, problem no. with Germany. That that has been Angela Merkel was the only one <coughs> to go to Greece in the in the past uh -huh. weeks to just. Up, to, to just show that Europe uh, cares yeah. with and, and th th that Europe is present in Greece. And, well, she was the one who had the demonstrations and be because uh, <coughs> Hamad van Rompuy didn't appear in But she Athens. doesn't frighten anybody anymore. I mean, it's very, you know, everybody who lives as a foreigner in this country knows it. You have a quarrel with, a, with your neighbor or with a taxi, and you know the last argument is to say, ah, oh, for 60 years, it was, you know, no wonder <laughs> that you had, you know, everybody you has done it. You are like Hitler. <laughs> yeah, everybody has, does it, has done it, every foreigner. Then you are terribly ashamed. You think, oh, come. So, and it's the same, you know, uh, then you do a caricature of Angela Merkel with a, with a, a, a Mark or with a little moustache, uh, it's <laughs> silly. I mean, every you know, when you're in your good sense, you know that's yeah, there's absolutely no yeah. um, If we look ahead, the EU has been meeting in uh, one of its periodic crisis summits. 
Germany's finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, has put some very far-reaching new proposals on the table, saying what we need here is a whole lot more unity. We really need to be moving toward what would essentially be a government of federal European states. That certainly seems like the vision of a very convinced and committed European. That's true. This is a strong vision. Angela Merkel does not have this vision, or she does not she express has. it. She, she does not express it. Yeah. He says he consulted with her. Yes, 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 okay. But um, he's, he is outspoken, and uh, this is a, a, a vision which will work long term. I think that um, the Germans probably are the, the uh, have, 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 have the um, smallest problems with becoming more European mm. than we are today. They. Germany would have a referendum then, and we had to just everybody has to um, stand up for Europe or not. But I think the, the, the main problems have, have French people <laughs> is becoming we more German. We had big dumb. problems with Maastricht, yeah. and, and we, we will have enormous problems because, well, because we, we were never political dwarfs like Germany was. We were always a big nation, or we think mm. we still think that we're a big nation, uh, sort of ruling the world mm. politically. And uh, to give up our political independence would be very difficult in France. And the UK. Well, yeah. I think Especially. the UK are out. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The UK yeah. initially yeah. had no reaction to the Nobel Peace mm. Prize mm. announcement. For several hours, they basically had nothing to say and this, at this, all. And this was very loud that they had nothing a to say. A very loud silence, yes. yeah. Yeah. resounding uh, silence. I think that, that is uh, one of the, the most striking things mm. of the Nobel Prize, that um, the UK is just in a... And it seems to be in a dynamic which goes up in the, in the, in the completely different direction. Speaking of directions, Pascal, uh, pretty much uh, last words for this program. If we look ahead, you say the French would have problems with that deeper kind of integration that Wolfgang Schäuble has proposed, which would, of course, have to involve a renegotiation of basic EU treaties. But is it nonetheless probably the only way forward? I think so, and I think I think uh, as you mentioned before, we are, we we can expect a lot of negotiation, a lot of thoughts, a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, uh, yeah debating, uh, and then maybe it will come through. But I think it's 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 probably the only way. But it's difficult because it has to do with mentalities, with traditions, with fears, and to overcome all this is is a very long process. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in.